welcome to Chit Chat Money. On this show, hosts Ryan Henderson and Brett Schaefer interview industry experts and riff on the world of investing. As a quick reminder, Chit Chat Money is a CCM Media Group podcast. Ryan and Brett are also general partners at Arch Capital, and Arch Capital may have positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Anything discussed on Chit Chat Money by Ryan or Brett or any other podcast guests is not formal advice or recommendation. Now, please enjoy this episode. Welcome into Chit Chat Money. My name is Brett Schaefer, and I am joined by my co-host, Ryan Henderson. Today is our Tuesday not-so-deep dive episode where we analyze one stock by covering its business model, ownership, financials, and future growth opportunities. After listening to this episode, we hope you get a better perspective on the company we are covering. And today, we are talking about American Express, one of the payment network and credit card giants that is also one of the oldest companies in the world. Ryan is going to get into their history and what they do. But first, before we get to today's episode, uh, this episode is presented by Stratosphere, our investing home screen for fundamental research. And whoops, Ryan, you shared the screen there and cut off my uh, my script. For fundamental research, Stratosphere has awesome data visualizations, SEC file aggregations, and custom-built KPI tools that are not available anywhere else. For example, today, we're going to be taking a look at American Express's revenue per share. Ditch Yahoo Finance and up your investing knowledge by using stratosphere.io. We use Stratosphere as our investing home screen, and you can too for free by going to stratosphere.io. That is stratosphere.io. The link is in the show notes if you would like the spelling. Okay, Ryan. Is that that our tagline? Or is that, did we come up with that? Did Yahoo Finance? I I came up with that for our new script, yes. So that is is from my brain, yeah. I think it's It's good. It's definitely a level up over... Yahoo Finance. Yeah, there's no 100% Yahoo Finance. You don't need that buggy stuff that is usually not accurate anyways. But yeah, Ryan, why don't you get into American Express, what they do? A little bit complicated, but yeah. also fascinating. And then the history, which is a fun one because it's almost 200 years old now. Yeah, it is. You know, it's been around for a while. Um, I, I'm not sure how relevant some of that history is to, you know, the, the business today, but. Uh, it, it's still a fascinating story, nonetheless. Um, so I, I guess let's start with what they do. You could, I, I would probably describe American Express as a specialty finance company. You could say they're consumer finance, but they also sell the businesses as well. So they offer a lot of commercial or business services. Um, but they are really they operate across the transaction life cycle. So unlike a lot of financial institutions, which typically focus on a particular segment or subsegment of the financial industry, Amex operates really across the whole life cycle. So in, kind of to go back to a typical transaction to, to give sort of a broader glimpse, um, someone will insert their card. If you're buying, let's, you know, let's say you're buying shoes or something, you're gonna, the, the customer is going to insert their card to a point of sales terminal. The card is typically issued by their bank and it'll have a card network that, that, that powers it. Um, so they'll insert the card in the merchant's point of sales terminal. The merchant will get the point of sales terminal from any number of providers. American Ex- That is probably the one part of the life cycle where American Express is not a part of. They, they, they don't distribute point of sales hardware as far as I know. Um, and then the merchant acquirer, which is generally Stripe or Adyen, um, also could be American Express. American Express is a merchant acquirer as well. Sends that data, sends the customer's data to the card network. So that is where you typically have the MasterCard, the Visa, or in this case, American Express as well, um, who then queries the, the original issuing bank. So that could have been Chase, Bank of America, or American Express. Um for authorization. So once it's authorized, it'll display some sort of a transaction authorized. It has to know that you have like the right amount of funds, that kind of thing. American Express basically operates in every one of those segments. So it's got, it, it is the card issuer in many cases. It has the bank accounts uh, or it has the availability for bank accounts for the customers. It is the merchant acquirer 
for the actual merchants themselves they process those payments and then they, they are the card network so they actually uh are, are, are routing the orders to basically themselves it's a closed network um and i think it's the only business I can say with confidence it's the only business in the United States that's an entire closed network, correct? I think Discover might be, but they're kind of losing a lot of market share and they're very player today. If we look at, I also don't know exactly Discover's business model, but it's possible they run the same one as American Express, but they have in the United States 1% to 2% market share where American Express is closer to 10% plus. Okay. And then uh, basically... Uh, American Express performs all those functions, so they make money in predominantly three ways. There's some other ways as well, but these are really how they break down their business. So the first one is discount revenue. This is merchant transaction fees. So on each transaction where a customer uses an American Express card to pay, the merchant is charged a small fee that gets paid out to Amex. I know it seems small to us, but it might not be. Uh, it might not be small to the merchant. And this is very similar to Visa and Mastercard. Amex charges anywhere from it'll be like 10 cents fixed so a 10 cent fixed charge plus 1.6 percent of the transaction or even goes as high as almost three and a half percent in some cases it's estimated that amex's fees are on average 50 percent higher than visa and mastercards however in the us today 99 percent of merchants accept american express despite these higher fees likely because of the attractiveness of american express's cardholder base american express generally regarded as a more affluent customer base people that maybe uh, yeah maybe top quartile of for each wealth. region they're kind of going for that uh, of wealth of, of income and then for reference on that uh the the fee difference it has been coming down over time so it's not as big of a difference today but that has been a headwind for american express over the last couple decades yeah and then that segment so the the merchant fees accounts for about 58% of revenue, at least it did in 2022. The second one, and this one's really unique to American Express, I think there might be some other card companies might offer this, but not quite to the magnitude that American Express does. Um, this is card fees. So unlike other card issuers who, in my experience, tend to give their cards away for free, or they're like a one-time kind of charge for the actual card itself, American Express charges people, you know, uh, in order for them to be a member of American Express. So, um, and it's an annual rate. So the rates vary depending on the market. There are, there is like the blue card or something like that that American Express offers that's free. There's, there's, there's no membership fee. But in order to have the platinum card, which grants you access to like the American Express lounges at, um, airports and there's a number of other benefits as well you have to pay 695 dollars a year in the us um, and that's been going up over time for the gold card it costs 250 dollars a year um, and then each of these cards kind of comes with your um a variety of different partner packages essentially where you can earn cash back for um flights or hotels or i think on the gold card uh you can earn uber points they have a big partnership with delta um and so they have a number of co-branded cards that way as well um anyways this is 11 percent of revenue really high margin i imagine i don't think they break it out explicitly um but i mean they, they're basically just charging to be a member of their club essentially um keep in mind though they do pay back um there are some expenses in terms of uh offering the benefits to customers the last one here this is the last big one at least is interest income this is the more common way credit card companies make money american express charges customers an interest rate on any carried balances in their accounts um they also originate simple loans to their card holders so beyond just like the the carried balances they will you know grant them loans and card holders aren't just as i mentioned individuals it can also be corporations as well so they're giving out those loans um like other businesses though they have interest expenses as well so there's a cost for them to generate those funds to loan out and so um, in this rising rate environment that we've seen over the last year interest expense has risen a little bit um and so when you see basically there's the interest revenue which is what they're earning on their loans minus what it costs for them to acquire those funds to lend out um and so that's uh, th that 
uh, differential has uh, contracted a little bit as rates have risen. Um, and so it, it, the net interest income has shrunk this year. However, it generally accounts for 19% of the revenue. Typically, when you have a rising rate environment, and I'll talk about this in my highlights, when you have a rising rate environment and you're a credit card company or you're a lender of some sort, your interest income is really going to get squeezed. It's happening for American Express in some ways, but because it's only 19% of their revenue, um, they're really not as as affected because uh, they have such diverse revenue streams. The last segment, well, I guess there's some other segments as well that are kind of minuscule, but there's service fees and other revenue. I'm putting that in air quotes. Um, it's predominantly made up of travel commissions. So if you go online, you can look up American Express travel and you can like book your trip through American Express. Um, travel providers will pay Amex uh, or American Express uh, kind of a kickback or a commission. They don't typically call that out, but because of the boom in travel last year, revenues jumped by 36%. Um, and it's it's made up a sizable portion. So they really, they and they are kind of just generally tied to um, travel and entertainment spending. Um, and so they, they get a lot of their spending from that. Um, so this last couple of years was really good for them. I guess ultimately what what's important to understand here is american express operates around what management calls a spend centric model it's really based around their cards it's based around people feeling like they're a member when they become an amex card holder um and and amex kind of monetizes those customers in a number of ways spending lending um, and then, and then, obviously, uh, generating that revenue from the merchants as well. But when we talk about the history, uh, uh, Ryan, guess, before you, anything, yeah, yeah, before you get into it, I think just for context for the listeners or the viewers, I think this would be a good time to share their total network transactions uh, over time. Just before we get into all the numbers, to give some context here. So let me just share my screen and I'll describe it real quick. It's super, super simple. But if we look at, um. Here we have the chart here over at Stratosphere total network transactions, and this is in millions. But regardless, it's uh, last year they had about one point five trillion dollars, and since twenty twelve, it's generally trended higher and grown at a compound annual growth rate of about five point seven percent. You can kind of see in twenty uh, fifteen, twenty sixteen, twenty seventeen, it stalled out a bit, and that's mainly because they lost the Costco partnership. Then, which we might hit on this episode, might not. And then in twenty twenty, huge dip because travel and spending, I guess in general, it's like a big bite. American Express was probably more exposed because of the you know impact on the uh, airline partnerships, the impact on the hotel partnerships. But then in twenty twenty one and twenty twenty two, we've seen a huge rebound. And last year, like I mentioned, $1.55 trillion in total network transactions. And then compared to 2020, or excuse me, 2019 at 1.66 trillion. But Ryan, yeah, keep going on that. Uh, any relevant history for the listeners? It's probably important to talk about the size comparatively to the other big card networks. So despite Visa and MasterCard have wider distribution, they um, they have a lot more card holders. However, American Express, because they really focus on that um, more affluent, higher spending customer, and they monetize that customer in a number of ways, I believe Amex has more revenue than both Visa and MasterCard, but I'm going to double check that. Um, yeah, and it's because they have the vertically integrated model as well. There's lots of differences. And we'll talk about, uh, I guess, you know, later in the episode, how in the US, American Express is caught up on the, the merchant distribution, but international, they're still far behind Visa and MasterCard. Yeah. Anyway, why don't I hop to the history? Because um, it's it's kind of just fun to look at. So American Express was founded in 1850. Yes, that is correct. 1850. Um, they were an express mail business in Buffalo, New York. So the way I understand it is there was basically three different express mail um, companies or offerings within Buffalo. And, and people would pay these um, companies to bring their mail to New York, New York City faster than you know you could by giving it to someone who's taking it on horseback or something like that. Um, Anyway, they, they basically had built a business around this, and there were these three separate express mail businesses. They were started by Henry Wells, William Fargo, and John Butterfield. Those first two may have combined later, right? <laughs> those those first two, I believe, I think it was not that long after, I want to say 
like two years after or something like that. Um, the, the consolidated company, they were really saying like, let's expand West. Let's go to, you know, let's go outside the Eastern States and try to try to expand the business that way. And the rest of the business didn't want to. And so Henry Wells and William Fargo started their own company, little known uh, bank known as Wells Fargo today. Um, and so, yeah, they did. I think they may have missed out on hard to say because they've, you know, become a big business in, in themselves, but um, maybe missed out on a potential opportunity there. Anyway, seven years later, they, they got their real start in the financial services business when they expanded into the money order business. They also became a real international presence in uh, the 1890s when they introduced the traveler's check. I believe they were the originator of the traveler's check concept. Um, and then they were kind of because they were sort of one of the monopolies at the time, they were one of the companies that were hit hard by um, kind of the crackdown on monopolies at the time. Who was the president? Do you remember? It wasn't Woodrow Wilson at the time. There was another. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt. There's a few. There's a few different. It's hard to really track. I remember we covered that in the History of Financial Markets show, and it was almost like today where it was a hot potato that no one wanted to touch. And eventually all this stuff got passed uh, by the Supreme Court. Yeah, and American Express kind of got broken into different parts, um, but it, it, that really isn't the business that it is today. I would say American Express today kind kind of began to take shape around the '50s. So in 1958, American Express um, launched their first charge card. Interesting note: shortly after Warren Buffett bought American Express, American Express for the first time in his Buffett partnership. So this is before the Berkshire Hathaway days. Um, I think he sold it though at a modest, modest profit. And this was right after there was, and I, I didn't jot any notes down on this, but there was this salad oil scandal. And so there was like, somebody had basically been defrauding American Express by faking their collateral. And it, basically there was like this, I forget what it was. It was like, yeah, it was like salad. It was barrels full of what they called salad oil or something like that. But under, like, it was diluted down. And so it was basically just a bunch of water. And people were like checking the inventory for collateral and uh, ended up being some giant scam where American Express kind of got ruined for it um, or, or got hurt by it. And then shortly after, I believe Buffett ended up taking his first kind of uh, stake in the business, ended up selling it. Buffett did later start accumulating. And, and Brett's going to talk about this. Um, uh, now 20% ownership of the business. I think Buffett talked about that in his letter this week, actually. He he finished accumulating his American Express position in the 90s, I want to say. And Early 90s, yes. Yeah. It was about $1.3 billion invested in total, I believe. Um anyways, that's the Fred will talk about that in a second here. Um there was a there were a couple formative things that happened in the last 10 years that that I think are important for investors to watch because it it uh, could happen again in 2015 they lost Costco as one of their co-branded credit partners at the time 10% of American Express's cards in circulation were Costco co-branded there were concerns that this could kind of lead to catastrophe for Amex um and the stock fell as much as 35% following the news since and it led, it led to a leadership change too, really, uh, most likely led to the leadership change. Yeah. And, and the revenue, as, as you alluded to earlier, kind of collapsed a bit as well, um, just or slightly declined. Um, but since that time, American Express's cardholder base has continued to grow. They've replaced Costco with other partners. Um, Delta is now a huge co-brand, uh, a huge partner. Um and so they they do love this partner's model. I would say um, there are a lot of retailers or wannabe partners uh, to pair with American Express. So I think it's kind of a moat test here that they were able to survive. Um, and you know it may have been their fault, I guess, to to lose the Costco partnership, but they were able to survive that and really still be uh, quite a resilient business. So that's that's where they're at today. Um, I think it's 130. Make sure I get the number right. 133 million total cards, total total card members. Um, 1.6 trillion dollars in annual network volume. So it's it's a very large business. It's a huge part of the really the American economy. I remember that if you took their dollar volume um, in GDP terms, 
the CFO, I believe, said they would be the 16th largest country in the world. So it's it's obviously a very large business. Yep. And let me share the screen quick on the cards and force. This is basic cards and force, which is a little bit different, but that's the ones that they, the core ones they do that aren't that, uh, there's just a weird difference that they segregate out some of the other ones. But if we look again, they've grown at 3% a year, but if we hit 2015, once they lost Costco, they lost a good amount of the cards and force and it stagnated for a while. In 2020, they lost some people, you know, because of the pandemic, but the last two years coming out of the pandemic, They've really regained their growth rate and right around when the, well, it's a few years after the new executive team took over, which I think is a good sign. We'll kind of talk about their long-term strategy going forward. And then a few other facts, or just one other fact, is that the Delta partnership accounts for 10% of their transaction volume right now. So that's a key one to talk about or, or to watch. However, they do have them locked under a contract until 2029. So I guess not a concern for a long while. Okay, let's hit industry and competition. You know, the the credit size or credit card market size is kind of hard to pin down the exact number. I saw a real range of estimates from different sources. I don't know if it's too relevant here to talk about the total addressable market because in reality, we're talking about the payments market and it is huge. There's trillions of dollars in volume each year. That is growing. That is inflation protected, all that good stuff. Now, if we look at the card, uh, actually, I wrote card competitors. This would be the payment network competitors. You have Visa, who has 61.6% market share in the US, MasterCard at 26% market share in the United States, and then Discover at 2.2% market share. Amex, as we might say for American Express, has an estimated 10.5% of the total card spent in the US as of 2021, which is actually down from 15.6% in 27, 2007. Um, digging deeper, they're competing with the credit card issuers as well. So they're competing with people like Capital One, JP Morgan Chase with their Chase Sapphire Reserve, and then many other banks that have travel and business cards. I think an important note here, what if anyone's concerned about the volume declines versus Visa and MasterCard gaining share, Amex has a much higher percent of volumes from credit cards, almost the vast majority of their business, than Visa or MasterCard, who are really debit or credit card agnostic, which has been a key reason why they've lost market share because debit cards have grown faster than credit cards, which I don't think Amex is too concerned about because they're really targeting that you know top quartile percentage of the US market and then some of the other markets that they sell into internationally. And they don't really care if some young people like us are you know, spending for groceries on a uh, Visa or MasterCard debit card. Now, if we look at the other competitors, I was trying to nail down some stuff outside of, you know, the big three card networks, which I might consider at least in the United States to be Visa, MasterCard, and Amex. There's some people that are trying to disrupt them. I guess there would be buy now, pay later. There's crypto, their government systems, um, which I will link to a source outlining India's uh, fast paying United Payments interface. So there are some th- you know concerns about Federal Reserve uh, type banks doing that. And there's really any other digital payments method that does not require you to connect your debit or credit card to the account. If that's not a piece of the system, then that's a you know competitor to Amex. Um, what do you think, Ryan? Here's, I have a discussion question here. What are the most legitimate threats to the big three cart networks? Because for me, outside of the government stuff, I find very little... To be concerned about, I honestly had trouble coming up with any competition outside of the the big three kind of oligopoly here competing with each other. Yeah, I mean, perhaps um, the government stuff, as you mentioned, some, but you know, I I feel like that rarely works. Um, I would say there's the potential that even though it's more of a partner than a competitor, um, if Apple Pay. Um, Ooh, starts yeah, to take yeah. a lion's share of like what the way that payments are made, even though it might be an Amex card or a Visa card or, you know, MasterCard, you know, distributed card. Um, there might be more negotiating leverage towards Apple Pay if a lot of people are opting to use that as sort of their payment dis- uh, payment method. So maybe there's some fee compression because of that. But I I have a hard time seeing how any of these would get disrupted. Yeah, that is an interesting point. I think that's something to watch as well, whether the, I think from American Express 
their perspective. They're hoping that there isn't kind of a big winner in the payment space. They're hoping Google Pay is good, you know, successful. They're hoping Apple Pay is successful, Venmo, Cash App, and well, even Zelle, I guess, as well. So they kind of have it's a more rational industry versus a, a winner take all that might just take a huge negotiating uh levers there. But yeah, let me get to management and ownership. Pretty simple. The chairman is Stefan. Either Stefan or Steven, I can never remember, uh, Squarey, who was named to this role in February 2018. Again, apologies, Stefan, if you are listening. Uh, his last name is S-Q-U-E-R-I. I think it would be Squarey, but uh, it's a difficult name to pronounce. He is a did lifer you, at Amex. Did you watch The Investor Day at all? I did, but I don't remember how they pronounced it. He's a New Yorker, though. He's a big time New Yorker. I liked his accent. He... He made just like the strangest joke at the start, and everyone it was like it was like this rehearsed joke that's like you guys all look, you guys all look like you put on weight since we last spoke or something like that. <laughs> like, what? yeah, it was a tough. Anyway. Uh, it didn't. It, either way, the investor day I think went well. I liked it, but the start out they uh, they they start out low. But he is a lifer at Amex. He joined the company in 1985. So. They, they like to hire from within. They got a good mix of people in their executive ranks that have worked at the business for multiple decades and some outsiders they brought in like, you know, the chief technology officer and a few other people that they're trying to modernize and catch up with Visa and MasterCard. If you look at the board of directors, it's fairly standard for what it might, I might categorize as a, you know, quote unquote Dow Jones t- company, which they are in the Dow uh, with plenty of independent directors from a variety of industries, lots of seats. And, you know, they pay them a few hundred thousand dollars each year. With the size of the company, the board of directors pay is not a concern at all. Really saw no red flags there. What you have anything to add there, Ryan? Not only are they a Dow Jones company, they were in the original Dow 30. So I don't know how many companies are left from the original Dow 30, but they're still I they're think one of them. they could be the only one left. Uh you know, if you're gonna base your investments off the Lindia effect, this is this is your number one holding because they have stick around for a long time. Um, but yeah, executive compensation back to the you know management here. They have three criteria. Of course, it's classic compensation consultant uh, stuff here. You have the base salary, annual cash bonuses, and long-term performance stock awards. Total exec compensation was seventy-seven point five million in twenty twenty-one. It's a really not big deal. About one percent of twenty twenty-two pre-tax income. So as a proportion to the size of this business, not a big concern here. The annual bonuses are based on a wide variety of metrics like revenue growth, earnings per share, net promoter scores, and something that I was thinking about for at least 10 minutes after reading it, where they said, and this is the exact quote, firing up the core engine, which makes no sense to me. Luckily, 50% of the weighting are to the key financial metrics. I don't think that was a huge deal. I think think they're just trying to start up some, some ESG stuff to get those type of things in line, which it's not a huge concern, but watch out if, if they do all their incentives at 50% on firing up the core engine, quote unquote, which again, I have no idea what that means. Maybe you can get concerned, but right now it looks like their incentives are in line with shareholders. And speaking of which, I really liked their long-term stock awards. They're based on three-year average return on equity, which I think is a relevant for their company. And then total shareholder return or TSR versus peer group companies, again, on a three-year basis. I thought that was good. I left out a quote for the newsletter, which again, subscribe to, to get you know in conjunction with this episode um, on how that's all calculated out. Ownership, like Ryan mentioned, Berkshire Hathaway owns 20%. Then we got Vanguard BlackRock with their standard 6% stakes. And then if we look at all directors, executive officers, they own less than 1%. So yeah, no founders here. They're all dead. Um, long, long I think gone. that's it. The, long uh, gone. Yeah. Does Berkshire owning it matter to you at all? Eh, yes and no. I think it's good from a financials perspective as a financials company with credit exposure. It's good that one of the best in that category ever has is looking at them closely as one of their largest holdings. But on the other hand, from a say, it's not too big of a deal because they're not taking activist stakes really anymore. Um, he's not on the board. It's not, he's, they're not in that part of their career, you know, as a company. So, and he said that Amex is a never sell for them. So I don't think it matters too much because maybe management at Amex kind of has that, you know, on their shoulder, kind of the, the the Buffett, 
I don't want to call him the devil, but like the the person who, you know, that they're always know is there, they feel is there as someone who's like, hey, if we make this decision, is our largest shareholder going to be pissed? Possibly that's happening, but yeah, I don't know if I would buy or sell based solely on whether Buffett owns this because he's owned it for 30 years. It's not yeah. like where he's buying, they're buying today. Yeah, that's true. I j- yeah, I do think it sometimes influences management's like, decision making or just like you know them thinking like well we do we should be cognizant of our largest shareholder here it would probably prevent them from being maybe too self-serving in in some ways but uh maybe they just don't at this point i think he's so passive in his ownership that it probably doesn't matter that much um let's talk about earnings though kind of just go kind of to paint a financial picture of what this business look like, looks like, they do $51 billion in annual revenue, or they just reported their 10K. So um, in 2022, they did $51 billion in total revenue. That was up 25% year over year. I already kind of uh, described what the revenue mix is like, but most of that is merchant fees. They, they did have a, a big boost in the service fees from the travel commissions as well. Um, but they have $41 billion in total expenses with the largest part of that being card member rewards. And then the rest of the business is kind of what you think it would be. It, it's very, um, uh, you know, they, they require tech talent. They require a bunch of uh, corporate employees um, and they, they got to pay out a big chunk of expenses um, to those people. And there was actually an interesting quote um, during the CFO made a presentation at, it was like the bank of America consumer finance conference or something like that. Um, And they mentioned, they were like, you know, what are you thinking about kind of recessionary fears? How would that impact your business? We're seeing a lot of layoffs right now. And the CFO basically said like, first of all, um, to the people being laid off, we'll gladly hire you. Uh, We recommend applying here because uh, he, he said like, do you have any idea how hard it is to get good tech talent these days? And so I thought that was kind of an interesting point that he, um, they are still kind of trying to, even though it's potentially recession or a slowdown, they're kind of attacking the opportunity they see in front of them. Um, as for kind of earnings here, they, they generate about ten billion dollars in pre-tax income or twenty percent pre-tax margins, which is a they've averaged about twenty percent pre-tax margins since like the nineties. Um, so it's really consistent there. They they really invest back into the business. They haven't like juiced margins by any means. Um, or, or they, they, it seems like they try to keep it around 20%. Um, and they pay out about this year, they paid out $5 billion through repurchases and dividends, um, or, or about 70% of their net income typically. Uh, and that's, that's more heavily weighted towards repurchases. Um, but they do, uh, they, they do return a lot of capital to shareholders. And then just in terms of like qualitative or less, less financial metrics, um, 133 million total cards in force. That's growing about 3% annually over the last 10 years. So it's not rapid growth in the card member base. They're, they're pretty choosy about who they let in to be an Amex card member that you have to have a certain credit score in order to be a, uh, a card member with Amex. Um, and then there's 1.6 trillion in annual network volume. And so the actual volume across Amex cards has grown by 6% annually over the last 10 years. Um, so the, their card members are actually spending more over time, um, but but solid, steady growth really over the last I want to say forty years or so. So um, not not really one that you you uh, invest in. I think based on like a single year's earnings or, or numbers or anything like that, you're kind of yep. trying to predict the quality of the business over time. Yeah, yeah. And two things to add there: one, when you're looking at net income, make sure to look at each year their net uh, charge offs or their net. I think that's what they describe it, right? Basically what they're allocating or unallocating for credit losses each year, because that can make things a little bit cyclical. So I like to look at their net income and then also their earnings minus the net charge offs to kind of get the core stuff that might be a non-cash charge that changes each year. And then second, Ryan mentioned the employee efficiency. Their revenue per employee since 2005 has grown at a 4% rate. It's kind of stagnated in recent years, but I think that's somewhat because they're still getting a bit of a headwind from the pandemic and there were a few expenses that kind of increased there. So I'd hope it trend higher over time, but yes, very efficient on that front. And maybe with all the layoffs of the big tech companies that are sexier than Amex, they could get some spillover and get some 
you know, good talent over the next couple of years. And the, the, the charge offs thing you mentioned, I'll, I'll talk about that here in the balance sheet, but it's, that's included in their net revenue figure basically through, um, when they'll report interest revenue and then they'll do the interest income or sorry, the, uh, uh, in interest expenses. Um, and basically we'll deduce to a, uh, net interest income figure and they'll tack that onto their revenue from the other line items. But um, when we look at kind of the asset side of the balance sheet, $34 billion basically in cash and interest bearing deposits, they just kind of invest the majority of that in short-term uh, investment areas. Um, and then they have $57 billion in card member receivables. Most of that will will be received. They do write off some of that. Um, if you know the if they feel like a certain percentage of of, of those receivables aren't going to come in, um, and so the net write offs jumped from 0.2% in 2021 to 0.8% in 2022, still much smaller than um, peers in the space. Um, but it's worth noting that 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 may uh, begin to affect some of that interest income. Uh, that, that that's a key it's a key yeah, it's a key number to watch for sure especially over the next few years if we're worried about a kind of bull whip of economy recession and all that good stuff yeah they, and then they have this so that's the card member receivables so that's just like what they've uh credit they've allotted to their customers and then there's 108 billion dollars in loans to card members as well the percentage of loans that are 30 days past due are at about one percent uh in 2022 the year before they were 0.7 percent and in 2020 they were one percent again so they really haven't seen that much of a fluctuation due to the higher interest rates and they actually um they kind of talked about they talked a lot about the lending quality with the business these are more financially savvy customers that pay back that that are generally more credit worthy and so they have much lower um delinquencies than a lot of the other credit providers and then on top of it i believe they on carried balances, um, they have higher interest rates than a lot of other customers or than a lot of other uh, credit providers. And so people tend to pay off Amex first um, when they're trying to uh, you know, get back within kind of the uh, credit borrowing or trying to get, I guess, uh, trying to pay off their loans or credit. They want to pay off Amex first because of the higher interest rates um, and because maybe they want to make sure that they maintain being an Amex member because of all the social signaling it provides, which we'll talk about in a second. Liabilities, basically $43 billion in long-term debt outstanding. The majority of that is fixed rate senior notes, all pretty reasonable interest rates, 2.8 to 4% range. Um, and the maturities date all the way out to 2042. The rest is kind of a mix of floating rate debt that I didn't see any, any rates that were too crazy. Um, uh, and I think part of that is just because they have like different subsidiaries across the business. And so they, they have to borrow in certain jurisdictions or stuff like that. And so they, they have some floating rate debt, but the majority here is just low cost um, fixed rate. So really you're looking at right around nine, $10 billion in net debt uh, for a business that generates 10 billion, at least in pre-tax income. Uh, this, this is not too much leverage at all. Yeah, and there's a few different ways you can calculate the net get debt because it just depends on how you do it. Because the way I did it, and I can't honestly can't remember what I used for the calculation, I had net debt of 5.4 billion, but really not a huge difference. Uh, if we look at valuation, keep it quick. Market cap, 130 billion dollars. EV is going to be slightly higher, and then the only really metric I would think is relevant for Amex is going to be enterprise value to earnings. And right now we're at exactly 18. Pretty close to the market average, quite you know a little bit below, and it's right around their historical uh, PE or or EV to earnings. And if we flip that around, their earnings yield, I guess, on this enterprise value, which will be the same as their you know on their market cap as well, is about five point six percent. So you're getting that sort of yield on the uh, stock each year. Um, we'll talk about what that implies for what you need to expect if you want your you know, returns to be above 10% going forward and stuff like that. But yeah, that's kind of how I'd like to look at it because for this company, a lot of it is part of the capital, you know, a big part of it is the capital returns. So this is how they're funding their dividend. This is how they're funding their buybacks. Uh, but yeah, all right, let's move to the fun stuff. Anecdotal evidence, Ryan. 
I guess this really matters here, sort of. It's not our opinion isn't the sole uh, arbiter of what their brand is, but w- what are your thoughts on the brand? Uh, maybe we can give the listeners some context of what people in their 20s think of Amex. Yeah, I think this is regarded as a premium brand. It's considered luxury. Uh, a lot of it is just social signaling that, you know, you want to be perceived as wealthy. So you pull out your uh, Amex card and, and the Amex cards, I will say they are uh, quite literally built different. They like are a different material. Uh, I can't tell what, it, I don't know what it is, but it's, it's heavier. It kind of makes it. It's tight. Well, the black card is, the black card is titanium. So, yeah. Okay. Well, the, uh, I don't know. Apparently it's, it's, it's a flex as kind of people say today. Um, and it, it signals that you, you know, you pay $700 a year for your credit card and you can spend a lot, that kind of thing. Um, I think a lot of people also like the idea of sitting at these lounges, these really kind of nice looking lounges at airports. So they're willing to pay out to be kind of a member there. Um, I've seen I some big, as bigger for the young people too. Yeah. I, but I've seen like pictures where the lines are so long at these lounges and like, like, what's the point? You got to get there like five hours early for your flight just to like sit at that lounge. But yeah, um, they got to restrict it more. Let's get it only to the the top card members. But maybe, maybe they're being too uh, they're being too lenient on who they allow to have to be a platinum card member. But that's like a good and a bad thing because it means they're getting a lot of new card members. But you don't want to ruin that exclusivity feel. Yeah, yeah. But I guess just anecdotally, yeah, people will go a long ways to signal their wealth, and and Amex is one way to do that. Um, and I, I think it certainly still maintains that premium brand that it used that it's it's known for. Um, and also, I, I I used to be worried that like you know with the higher fees or whatever, merchants would be less inclined to accept it. But seeing that stat of ninety nine percent of merchants in the U S. accepting it, like if if I, I I think this is just really good uh it's it's really well received and there there really is um there the, the the stigma or the the reputation of of catering to luxury customers i think fits it's probably better for merchants to accept it because they know that they can attract a, a more affluent base who will probably come as as return customers too yeah i think when looking at this company there are two narratives out there that i think are actually misguided uh i was throwing out some tweets as well to see what what people think and i think there was a lot of them who i would have agreed with them before researching it um but i think they're wrong is one the say brand value or how much young people like amex they oh, there's kind of a narrative that that's deteriorating i don't really think that's true and if it is it's very very small compared to the other generations almost all of their new card members now are from millennial and gen z and then second they talk about the like people have this narrative that you can't like you can't just have amex and maybe that was true 10 years ago but the the new management team has worked to fix that and then as ryan mentioned they have 99 percent coverage now in the United States. So I think that's two positives where the business quality potentially could have changed over the last five years with this new executive team that has um, executed really well. But let's move to future growth opportunities. Ryan, what do you think here? It's a pretty simple one, get more card volume, but I guess what's one way you have for them to do that? Yeah. So I guess this is maybe not even the card volume necessarily. It's just um, maintaining more money on their platform. Um, and so this is converting more cardholders to American Express bank accounts. They've done this. They even the CFO basically said we could have done better with this to try to get people into the high yield savings accounts. And they were late. That, they were very late to this, right? Yeah. Well, I don't think they officially got a bank charter until 2008. So or they didn't officially become a bank until 2008. So maybe they were just late because of that. But um I, they didn't launch their first all digital checking account until this year. Um, and so they are still in the process of converting a lot of those. Um, they want more card members to be 
high yield savings accounts members as well. Um, and they, the CFO kind of discussed this for, I guess, two minutes or so uh, during that recent conference. He said there is significant overlap between those who have a card and those who have a high yield savings account, but not complete overlap. He said one of the things we probably under executed on for many years was mining both ways the power of the overlap. Um, so maybe even attracting high yield savings account first and then cross selling the cards. Um, the other thing uh, I guess yeah. worth mentioning is the uh, this th they are trying to focus on lending more. So they, they've really done a good job boosting spending, but they want to boost lending. This is something they talked a lot about at the investor day. Having more customer funds on the platform will allow them to lend more. Um, and, well, and easier, easier, easier. Yeah, sorry, it's it's lower cost. Uh, so it'll it'll allow them to potentially uh, a lower cost of funds will allow them to lend with a larger margin of safety. Yeah, I really like the fact that they're trying to launch these bank accounts. And I think, look, it's not bank accounts are sticky. It might be hard for people to switch over. But if someone can just open a bank account with American Express, that seems like a much higher, uh, well, maybe we'll call it an ARPU, an average revenue per customer or whatever earnings they get or the lifetime value of that customer seems much, much higher. And if I was someone who was a, you know, younger wealthy person and I, and I could open up an account with American Express or if I was a family and I had the ability to bank through American Express if I was to say you know one percent or family and wanted all that access and you know give the cards to the kids and you get them in that funnel I mean that seems like a much more I guess I'm trying not to use the word robust but I'll use it here a much more robust uh system that they can add on here which is with this product or I mean not just one product but the, all the banking products they're trying to push onto more customers and the CFO said they mentioned, or he mentioned that uh, they have now consolidated the high yield savings like group into or under the card, the the card group, and so apparently there was a disconnect between the two. They've tried to make the, like the internal changes to to get them better connected, but I think that should be a pretty easy cross sell. Yeah. All right. I'll hit mine. We do, as a caveat here, have a soft rule that we cannot use international growth as a future growth opportunity. Uh, but with Amex, I'm going to use a specific international growth opportunity that I think is going to be fine, where I think it can be a core driver of them getting to merchant parity with Visa or MasterCard. Uh, and that is simply investing in their sales outreach, outreach in more international countries. They've been doing this, but basically just continuing what they're doing and expanding from, how would I want to say, just you know the United States, Japan, Australia, and the United Kingdom to trying to becoming a fully global payments network like Visa and MasterCard. When the new management team took over in about the 2017, 2018 period, they decided to, tar to target a few international markets as they thought they were spread too thin. Um, and they really wanted to catch up in the United States and some of these other areas that their core customers are, you know, they want to have merchants be used there. But I think over the next 10 years, they can eventually expand to all relevant countries outside the United States which would be places like, well, they're investing a lot in China. I guess that might be a downside for me. But, you know, places like India, places like other places in Europe that might not be the big, you know, countries that people think about. This could be the Caribbean. They mentioned that as well. They, they got merchant, I don't want to say parity, but they invested a lot in the merchant base in the Caribbean where a lot of their customers vacation. Also in Central America, South America, where their, their customers might vacation. This will not only increase the value proposition for their domestic customers, which by domestic in this case, I mean their United States customers, um, but also the quote unquote world traveler customer that Amex targets in other wealthy countries. So I think it just would be really great for their whole system too. And will basically, it'll be harder for them to do it, but they can get to at least close enough for their client base to parity with Visa and MasterCard. It's just going to take them probably a decade, if not longer. What are your yeah, thoughts that, on that part, Ryan? Well, I don't think they'll ever reach the distribution of Visa and MasterCard just because it's that's just well, not Visa what they're going after. They have an inherent advantage, yes. Visa and MasterCard do, but it's good enough for their customer base. Yeah. I would say the I, I wish I saw a figure. I'm I'm not sure how what the merchant acceptance is abroad, but I'm curious. I feel like that's probably one of the biggest growth levers is making yeah, it was sure on the acceptance is good. Yeah, it, they, they gave some good numbers on the investor day. It's, it's lower than the United States. 
However, in some countries they gave, and maybe they're just showing the ones that did well, like France, they gave out some numbers on how they, you know, their NPS, their net promoter scores have risen, their merchants, um, I don't think is at parity with Visa and MasterCard, but is rising. So they're making progress there. And I think they can invest a lot into that over time and, and see good returns from customer retention and, you know, more card volume. As they say, the more, you know, people spend, the more they earn. Okay. Uh, highlights and lowlights, Ryan, what do you like? dislike about this business seems like we're a little bit in the same boat here uh lots of highlights and and low uh, not very many low lights which is is fun to see it's, it's exciting yeah there's a lot to like um so i having the diverse revenue streams i, I like that because it just makes them a little more resilient and sort of a difficult environment or financial environment so like um you know having the spend centric model this exposes them basically to lower credit risk than other financial institutions because they're not just relying on that net interest income like a lot of banks um and so i really like that um and they, they, i mean also like theoretically like if there's and this is another highlight for me is if interest rates are rising that likely means inflation is high which they are a direct beneficiary of that if the cost of goods goes up for all the for customers at all these merchant locations plane um, tickets that's a key yeah, one it's they benefit i mean they directly benefit they take a percentage of that transaction um and so revenue will probably outpace cost growth in those environments so that's a positive for me the other one is the premium brand i mean i think there's a lot of benefits to attracting a more affluent customer base um one they carry less credit risk but also they probably their spending is is more resilient in downturns, so um, they're probably, um, I guess, less levered to a consumer slowdown than maybe some of the other card issuers. And then lowlights, yeah. I, I honestly had a hard time finding any. Um, I would have, I would if I didn't see the merchant acceptance growth in the last three years, I probably yeah. would have said that like maybe they're um gouging merchants too much or maybe the card fees are too high but they've been able to consistently grow merchant acceptance and grow card members so that kind of puts both my worries to rest the international da distribution or disadvantage versus visa and mastercard you've already talked about it that's probably the only potential low light but i mean this is a very especially domestically it is this is a phenomenal and, and resilient business yeah and I think what's interesting is that in 2017, 2018, right after they lost the Costco partnership, right before this new exec executive team came into, uh, you know, to, to their roles, I think we would have had high, uh, much more lowlights, many more lowlights, but they kind of fixed a lot of those over the last few years. So it's, I think, again, this is what's interesting is that the narrative out there among the investment community might be different than what's happening at the, you know, with this business. And that could present an opportunity here. Not, we don't do buy or sell recommendations on here, but again, I think that's kind of, that, that kind of sets off the, the alarm for me that, Hey, there might be something that we're seeing here that is different than the narrative in the, uh, just kind of on wall street or investors in general. Yeah. And I'll, I'll add, you know, you talked about the new management team. I liked, the CFO a lot. I liked what he had to say. I liked all the people that spoke at the investor day. I liked the CEO, even though he had that weird joke. Uh, I'm not going to hold it against him. I think they've all done a really good job since they've been there. Yeah. And the track record's there. They they really, yeah, the, the pandemic was a bit of a hiccup for everyone, you know, but 2021, 2022, they showed that the investments they made are working. They're adding all these cards, all that good stuff. But yeah, let me get to my highlights. You know, I think a big one, the, the, the biggest one is the virtual distribution parity with Visa and MasterCard in the United States now. I think this means the industry has achieved oligopoly status. And I guess it was there really, but it's further solidified that each year and year out where Discover is, maybe they won't ever go away, but Discover will probably be gone and there'll just be these big three. And these big three can act more rationally, um, at least on the payment network side. Yeah, they're going to face a lot more competition from credit card issuers because Visa and MasterCard want as many as possible. But I like this because one, there's high barriers to entry. I don't think anyone could enter. Who, who, no one's going to become one of the big three here. It's just impossible. It's just how much market share are Amex, are they going to lose gain market share versus Visa and MasterCard? Um, second highlight, I think the international expansion strategy that they fixed starting in 2018 seems very rational and achievable. You know, they started working through kind of 
important cities for their customers or their core customers, which would be something like maybe Tokyo, Singapore, Sydney, uh, before moving to kind of all the rev- relevant regions eventually. What I really like about this is they can invest a lot into this expansion and will likely get durable returns for many years because you know payments are pretty standard across the world. The wealthy people spend on the same thing. So you can really connect the ecosystem together. And I also think what's key about getting to international parity are working towards as close as they can get with international parity is they can have a wider moat five years from now if they execute on that even further, which is a key indicator that Buffett likes to ask or a key question that Buffett likes to ask. And I guess sometimes we like to ask as well. Uh, third one, the cards and force editions have been strong post any of the Costco partnership. Um, and they've skewed towards the Gen Z and millennial customers, which are going to have higher lifetime values. They're going to be around for maybe 30, 40 years as Amex customers compared to a boomer or Gen Z, or excuse me, boomer or Gen X who might be you know, 20 years or something like that is the, yeah. is the big one. Ryan, you have some during, during the investor day, they said the millennial Gen Z customers, I'm not sure how they're measuring that specifically, like what the age is, have uh, 18 years uh, of greater lifetime value than their older customers. So, or the expected lifetime value than, than their older customers. So yeah, it's, that that's another big highlight. Yep. And then my last highlight, which we haven't talked about much, is the capital allocation strategy. It seems rational and importantly, consistent. Uh, shares outstanding have declined by almost 3% a year since 2017. And they've had this buyback strategy in for much longer than that. They are a share cannibal. And that's a reason why the Buffett stake has gone from, I think, like 10% to 20% without them touching their, uh, without buying more shares, which is great. That's got to be a great feeling to have, and, especially when it's such a big company. And his dividend is like, Fifty percent a year, a fifty percent yield on its cost basis. Here's a good question: Do you think now this might indicate this might spoil that we're a little bit uh, optimistic about this business? But do you think ten years from now they'll look at Amex in a better light as the Berkshire investment than uh, Coca Cola? Yeah, I think it potentially might, it might even be getting there. Yeah, like at this point. Just because the stagnation, know, kind of, that, yeah. Uh, the early years of the Coca Cola investment, like skew, like help him more. Yeah, it was so good so quickly. Yeah, yeah. But the, I, I guess this is. Do you think American Express will have a wider or be a better business in five years than it is today? I would bet yes, and it is because of the international investments they're making. Because if they make those and they're successful and adding merchants again, they're never going to catch Visa and MasterCard internationally. But I think if they get closer and they're in the core, you know, big travel areas that their wealthy clients want to go to, yeah, I think it'll be wider for sure. What do you think? Yeah, I do. I mean, they, they, at this point, they benefit from their own scale, right? More merchants want to accept globally because of all the card members that american express has so i mean that's uh going to be revenue added on to the business the it, yeah i could very much see like this business i mean the success feeds on itself obviously there's a little bit of like a cold start problem internationally in some of the markets but um they've got the reputation i think they've got like the cardholder base that it's attractive for merchants to accept this as a solution everywhere yeah all right, let's hit my lowlights before we close things out. I think Amex does have a uh, inherent distribution disadvantage versus Visa and MasterCard. Like we talked about just now, we they're working hard to fix this, but it is pro- it's probable or possible that they're never going to be able to catch up because they have to work really, really hard, or maybe not really hard, but they have to put in a lot of work to have the distribution where Visa and MasterCard kind of just sit there and let merchants and uh, customers come to them just because they aren't the card issue or they just, you know, are the payment network. So they're going to have an advantage there. Uh, but American Express, you know, there's other positives because of the vertical integration. Uh, other low that I found, and again, I couldn't really find any large ones or big kind of red flags, is the reliance on large partners, especially Delta Airlines. Delta Airlines is 10% of their transaction volume. And that's not, uh, that is not payments through for Delta Airlines flights or any Delta Airlines products that is through the Delta Airlines card. So they're probably getting poor unit economics on that, which I guess is fine. You know, it's probably not going to change. And the contract is through 2029. But 
they have to use that to drive volumes, drive customer acquisition. And I just wonder if that relationship can turn into a Costco one over time. We'll see. We'll see. I think they probably have a good relationship, but I would it, say it's still that, low that partnership is more like uh, disposable than Costco would be. Like, yeah, you know, if, there are probably a lot of other airlines that would be vying for that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, you may be right. And I think Delta gets a big benefit from that as well, because then they get seen as maybe if it's just ever so slightly the more premium brand versus United or American or what's the other big one? Southwest. Because you want Amex is not going to do a Southwest card. No, I agree. All right. Bull case <laughs> for you, Ryan. What do you think? Uh, I mean, the bull case is uh, just more of the same, really. Um, I think interest expenses are probably elevated right now just due to the the percentage of the the rapid increase in rates as opposed to like the gradual increase in rates so i think if interest expenses revert as a percentage of interest revenue um it's going to be higher net interest income so you'll have normalizing interest income potentially uh cardholder base continues to grow at three percent a year card fees continue to gradually increase they've, they've shown a really strong pricing power on the card fees and then the global merchant acceptance uh increases i think that's a a recipe for 10 percent plus top line growth and and I, I see no reason why they wouldn't be able to sustain that 20 percent margin that they've had yeah that's a good point and i tend to agree with you uh what ryan is mentioning is also what management is outlining they said they're outlining 10 percent plus revenue growth uh from 2024 onward and that will lead to since you know since their buyback program since a little bit of margin expansion uh even higher earnings per share growth probably you know in between 10 percent and 15 percent is a reasonable guess but and i'm looking at a stratosphere chart here for any listener only uh their net income per share has only compounded at seven percent since 2005 so you have to bet on a little bit of acceleration here. And yeah, since the new management team has taken over, if you can exclude the, you know, the pandemic period, they have shown a higher, you know, better success on growing that earnings per share number. And that's showing up as well in the card additions. But, you know, historically they've been a lower growth company. So I think that's kind of the better case maybe to add on as well. Um, but yeah, I'll talk about mine. It's similar, you know, it's just management hits on the targets that they that they set out for where you're trading at today an EV to earnings of 18. At those prices, it kind of indicates you need durable top line growth, um, but not too high, kind of in order to achieve maybe annual returns of 10% plus or more on the stock going forward. Uh, management's guiding to 10% revenue growth from 2024 onwards. Like I said, you add in the margin expansion, you add on the share repurchases, you add on the dividends. And I think if they hit that top line of 10% and maybe even a little less, maybe if it's seven to 8%, the stock can still do well going forward. Um, but let's move to bear case. Ryan, what do you have here? The bear case for me is that you know, we have some sort of a slowing spending environment, some sort of recession. Um, I think they'd be better positioned than peers in that, but it's still probably would create low enough earnings growth that you wouldn't get an attractive return from here over the next five years. Um, I know there'd be a lot of companies that would give poor returns in that sort of environment, but I think they, they'd be more hurt in terms of new card member acquisitions in a tough consumer environment because of the fees on those on, on becoming a card member. I, I think people would be more cost conscious so maybe they wouldn't lose members, but the the new members might go for the cheaper option in those sort of scenarios. Um, yeah, but, here's an example just for what, uh, you know, just an, an not an anecdote, a potential analogy is, you know, say there's less people at big tech making $300,000 a year that could transition to less people wanting Amex cards or less people having the uh, spending habits where it makes sense to have an Amex card. Yeah. And I mean, they also have a lock-in with a lot of enterprise businesses. So if those enterprise businesses shrink their workforce, um, there's, you know, less cards passed down to the uh, employees. That's uh, that's going to be a headwind to, card, to the card member base. Yeah. We didn't even talk about that today is the business side of things. I mean, it's too long for this episode, but if you're interested in it, they do have some 
potentially promising stuff over on their their business uh, stuff. With the, the the business cards they offer to members, some of the other you know working capital stuff they've been talking about as well with some of their acquisitions, I would recommend watching their investor day to get more information on that. But this show is going to go too long if we go into that. It'll take ten to fifteen minutes. My bear case is going to be really two things that I'm worried about: is one increased customer acquisition cost due to the proliferation of Visa and Mastercard back cards. So say for example, you know they are trying to renew a partnership with someone for these travel and entertainment partnerships or the travel and entertainment linked cards. I think Visa and Mastercard could potentially undercut them. Uh, as they have in the past, and that could lead to worse unit economics. But on the flip side, with this being an oligopoly with no new entrants coming in, I doubt this is going to happen to an extent where it really hurts American Express. But you know, they lost they lost the Costco partnership to to the Visa and City, uh, uh, whatever team. So it could happen. And that could hurt them. And then I also, I think the bigger concern for me is that they potentially are over earning right now where, you know, last time, or excuse me, last year, 2022, there was a big bump in spending uh, that couldn't potentially not hold up in 2023 and 2024. For reference in the newsletter, uh, I would look at the changes in the U.S. consumer savings rate that I linked to here. You know, we saw in 2020, consumer savings rate skyrocketed and that, you know, by definition, will lead to lower card volumes for someone like American Express. However, in 2022, we've seen it really, it went down to an all-time low where people are spending through all this XX savings. And then in, to start 2023, we've kind of seen it normalize back to that you know, 5 to 10% range that we've seen um, since the great financial crisis. I wonder if that will turn into a short-term headwind for American Express in 2023. It doesn't mean the business is screwed long-term, but it might mean they over-earned in 2022 specifically. Any thoughts on that, Ryan, before we close out? Yeah, I mean, that's a possibility, especially with the boom in, in travel spending and then being sort of tied to that. Uh, if, if there's any sort of reversion there, then they could be more disproportionately impacted than other card networks. Yep. All right. More or less interested before we end here. Yeah, I'm more interested. This feels like the kind of business that I like... Uh, the longer I invest, the more I realize, like, why don't I just own something like this, where it's like very durable, very predictable, um, rational management that returns capital to shareholders. It might not seem like the most asymmetric opportunity, or maybe it doesn't seem like there's like tremendous upside, but it's it's far more predictable, I think, than a lot of businesses out there. Maybe just the most uh important thing to understand here is it was in the original Dow 30 and it's in the Dow today. Like it's it's gonna be around for a long time. Yep. And they've probably had some bad management teams along with it. So and there's a reason Buffett owns it in his kind of permanent portfolio. Yeah, I'm in the same camp. I, I'm more interested. I might this might go into the category of stocks I'd rather buy at a PE below 15 because I'm worried about kind of that long-term earnings growth. And I want that margin of safety of, hey, if they don't grow that much, we could still get some good returns due to their capital allocation. But I'm still more interested in this business. Definitely going on the watch list. I think it's high quality. I think the new management team has done really well and can widen that moat over the next five years, just as they did over the last five. So yeah, more interested. Um, all right, let's wrap things up. We're talking next week, Nelnet, which is a unique financials company that we own in the Arch Capital Investors Fund. So we'll be doing it under that format. It'll be coming out Tuesday, same time. And then the month after, we're actually going to be covering dating apps. So we're going to be covering Match Group, Bumble. Uh, what's the other one, Ryan? I forget the names, but there's two other small ones we're going to be covering as well. So we'll cover some small cap ones and then uh, the two giant players. And then as it's a reminder... Like Oh yeah, you have Ryan, or it might be gr it's yeah. Grinder. Excuse me, Grinder. Well, there's another one too. Um, that's like a smaller one. Um, it's Spark Networks. Mm, good name. Spark Networks, Grinder, Bumble, Match Group. All right, yeah, that will be fun in March. Uh, just as a little tease there. As a reminder, if you're a regular listener to the Not So Deep Dive episodes, subscribe to our free newsletter and get our show notes and charts with each episode. The link will be in the show notes, or you can search chit chat money on Substack. If you like watching these episodes, you can do so either on YouTube or Spotify, uh, but you can also do audio only. We really, you know, we try to make it so you can listen enjoyably in audio format or 
in video format. Uh, and also, if you enjoy these episodes, give us a review on either Spotify or Apple Podcasts. We are not financial advisors. Anything we say on the show is not formal advice or recommendation. We are general partners at Arch Capital and clients may hold securities discussed in this podcast. Thank you all for listening or watching. We'll see you next time.